Waiting is hard. Sometimes all you can do is cry, how long? How long? But when you find the patience to be still, things tend to emerge, show themselves. Sometimes along the way, the important thing to do is to stop and wait. And then sometimes the way reveals itself, possibly even the marginal way. strong and clear ringing out far and near letting justice rule down let justice roll down like a rush of a stream comes a powerful dream Let justice roll down Let justice roll down How can we sing God's song in a foreign land? How long, O oh God, must we feel like outsiders, strangers in a strange land? A people held captive by fear, abuse of power, prejudice, and unjust institutions. How long, O oh God, must we be in fear for our children who are growing up in a world of terror and violence? How many people in our country need to be killed by guns until we muster the will and the courage to stop the madness? We long for your justice, for your peace. O oh God, we long to be released from these shackles of fear and injustice. And until that time, we cry out with the psalmist. How long? Holy and living God, we long for your justice, for your peace. May peace flow, let justice roll. We long 
to be released from the shackles of fear and injustice. May peace flow. Let justice roll. We wait, O oh God, crying, how long? May peace flow. Let justice roll. begin working on our toolbox, remember we're building a church, before we begin working on our toolbox today, let's say our responsive prayer. Ready to repeat after me? And remember, first we're holding on tight and then we're letting things go. Ready? We hold on to power. We hold on to greed. We hold on to things that we really don't need. We hold on to hatred. We hold on to fear. And close ourselves off till we can't feel you near. Let's let go. Open our hands, Lord. Help us let go. Good. Open our minds so your justice may flow. Open us up so your peace can pour through. And make our hearts ready so we can hold you. Amen. Nice job, everybody. All right, so we're working on our toolbox. Remember, we decided that the kind of stickers we want to have in our toolbox are going to be these name tags. God knows each and every one of our names and loves us just for who we are right now. Yeah, okay. So I was thinking about something else that we might have in our toolbox. It's getting kind of sunny and warm out and I'm feeling pretty cool wearing my shades. So one way that people use this tool of sunglasses, right, outdoors, is to protect us from sunlight. But if people wear sunglasses indoors, they're often trying to hide something. And the thing that they're often trying to hide is eyes that have maybe been crying or eyes that are crying. Hmm, that's sad. I don't, I don't think that in the church we're building, we want people to feel like they have to cover up their feelings. God gave us the ability to feel so many feelings and none of them are wrong 
None of them are bad. I don't want people to feel like they aren't safe in this church to express their feelings. So instead of this tool, I would like to put this tool in our toolbox. I hope you're all okay with this. I think in our church that we're building, we offer people comfort and we allow them to feel their feelings. It's okay to cry here and here's some comfort. We're here with you. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's great too. So in our toolbox, we're gonna have some tissues. I wanna do a little exercise, a little activity. Are you ready? You ready to make some faces? Here we go. First, I want you to make the happiest happy face you can make. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. <laughs> Happiness is a feeling. And it's a great feeling. It's an okay feeling. All right, ready? Make a sad face. Oh, I can see you all look so sad. Sadness is a feeling and it's okay. How about an angry face. Ooh, I'm scared to look. Ooh, ooh, see some angry faces out there. Anger is a feeling and it's okay. Now what about a scared face? Fearful faces. Oh, oh, you look so scared. It's okay. <laughs> Fear is a feeling and it's okay. Yeah, all feelings are okay. So, we're going to end with a little call and response prayer. This time, I'm going to make a statement and you're going to say, how can I keep from singing? <laughs> yeah, there's a whole chapter in the Bible called Psalms and they're kind of like songs and they're all about people's feelings. There's songs about feeling happy, songs about feeling sad, songs about feeling angry, and songs about feeling fearful. No matter what we're feeling, God wants to hear from us. It's okay to sing about your fear and your happiness and your joy and your anger. How can you keep from singing when you know God's listening, right? So here we go. I'll make a statement. You say, how can I keep from singing? Here we go. Whenever I feel sad or alone, whenever I feel frightened or angry, whenever I feel like life just isn't fair, I remember that I can trust in your faithful love. Amen. Nice job, everybody. See you next time.
my sleep the sleep of death lest my enemies say I have prevailed over her lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken Rejoice in thy salvation. I shall sing unto the Lord, because God hath dealt bountifully with me. I shall sing unto the Lord, because God hath dealt. This week I've learned about an experiment that apparently actually was conducted by researchers on rats. It's not the most ethical experiment ever conducted, but what they did was put rats in water and force them to swim until they reached the point of drowning. And then they did it again with more rats and instead of allowing them to drown, they rescued them just after they had given up. Then, after a period of recovery, put them back in the water, forced them to swim again. And what they discovered was that a rat that had been rescued would spend more time swimming the next time. It's almost as if, and it's probably unfair to think that rats feel hope, but it was almost as if they were experiencing hope. They had at least learned resilience. They had learned that once rescued, there is a chance that it will happen again and therefore is worth putting in more energy. They experienced what we experience in this psalm, this longing for God's presence, this hope this longed-for hope that comes out first as lament, Oh God, how long? How long will my enemies prevail over me? How long will I suffer? And then it resolves with, But I trust in your steadfast love. Hope is based on the fact that we have experienced in our past help from God, and so we anticipate that it will happen again. That's the substance of faith, holding on to the experience of God's presence so that we might experience that presence again. We are looking at baptism and the vows, specifically the vows around baptism and the ways in which that calls us into action, into justice, looking for and creating justice. And one of the vows from the very start of baptism has been to renounce evil. Yeah, what does that mean, right? To renounce evil? It sounds a bit, doesn't it, like renouncing your citizenship. When else do we use that word, right? You renounce your allegiance to one nation and you pledge your allegiance to another. And in a way, that's exactly what is being expected in baptism, or at least it was in the first century. To say that Jesus is my Lord is to at the same time say, Caesar is not my Lord. That language was very intentional in the early church. Proclaiming Jesus as Lord was proclaiming that your citizenship 
was not in the kingdom of the world. No, instead, it was in the kingdom of heaven. And so you would renounce one citizenship to claim the other. It was a bit metaphorical, not quite literal, as of course we see Paul in um, the book of Acts appealing to the rights that he has as a Roman citizen. So they didn't literally renounce their citizenship in the world. On the other hand, the Christian allegiance to something other than the state and the empire that they're a part of did lead to persecution of Christians in the early centuries of the church. That is, of course, until Emperor Constantine in the 4th century saw Christianity as a possible tool to unify his empire because people could convert to Christianity and so he created councils where bishops laid out what it meant to be a Christian so that you could know, are you in or are you out? based on what you believe. And in a tragic union, the church married the state, forming the Holy Roman Empire. And from that point on, renouncing evil took on a different perspective. Because evil became seen as something that lurks outside of the one true church, which was also the state. You were in or you were out. And you were judged by what you said you believed. So renouncing evil really did become about changing sides. Or at least proclaiming your allegiance, which was all neatly wrapped up in one package. The church and the state. Things have certainly changed in the centuries that have passed since then. What does renouncing evil look like today? Injustice is really the face of evil in the world today. And so resisting injustice, resisting that evil, renouncing it, is a way for us to honor our baptismal vows. Now, unfortunately, the way that injustice is expressed is quite often, almost exclusively, systemic. And tragically, so much of the systemic injustice that exists today has its roots in that unholy union of church and state. And so we have ownership of the evil that's in the world. It's an ironic twist that makes for a real challenge for Christians today in understanding our relationship to the church, to our society, and to the kingdom of God. What does it mean for you and for me to resist and renounce evil? That's not to say that there are not those who very legitimately lament how long. How long must I wait for justice? We can tick off a whole list of people who are suffering injustices in this world, things they've been born into, situations beyond their control because evil is indeed systemic injustice. And for those folks, it is clear that they need to hold on tight to any glimmer of hope of God's presence in their lives in the past and in this present to see them through, hoping that one day, they will go to the mountaintop and see the promised land, even if they don't arrive, that maybe their children or their children's children will. That is very real for many people in the world today. But it is also very true that many of us don't experience injustice that way, that we experience privilege and the power of our place in society. What does renouncing evil mean for us? Those of us who come from a social location of privilege and power need to understand that that is a tool 
that we need to use what we have been given to throw wide the doors, open them up. If you've been born with a key of privilege, then use that to unlock that door and leave it unlocked so that others who don't have the key can come in. That's a intentional, willing loss of power, not persecution. Too many who experience privilege feel that as a persecution and then think that they might be lamenting like the psalmist, how long? Well, if that's where we place ourselves, then we are missing the fact that we are not necessarily the ones who are crying out how long, but perhaps we are hearing it. Hearing in our ears the cry, how long will it take until you understand what your actions, or more likely your inaction, is doing to support systemic injustice in the world? That is hard for us to hear. It's not easy to sit in that place and understand what it is that God might expect of us. What is the good news if you understand yourself as part of the oppressive system, if you are the oppressor, not the oppressed? There are harsh words for oppressors. Can God love us? Of course. God's love the good news of God's love is that it is for not only the oppressed, but also the oppressor, the one who understands the position and changes their ways, who lifts up the cry of the oppressed and laments with them how long. Friends, when we hear that question, the real question is, how long will it take for us to respond with the answer that is right before us? How long until you and I lift the burdens, work for justice, renouncing the evil that exists all around us and is so easy to be complicit with, and instead work for the justice that ushers in the kingdom of God, which is intended, always has been and always will be, intended to be here and now. Our struggle is not external with evil, but internal, finding those places inside where we grapple with those tendencies toward what is unjust, what is truly evil, and renouncing that, that we may indeed find our salvation in the salvation of the community and the love of God manifest in justice in this world. Amen. I invite you to close your hands, making a tight fist if you can. This season, we will contemplate what we need to let go of in order to let justice roll down, to let justice prevail in our lives, in our church, in our world. I invite you to imagine that tight fist as a symbol of the frustration or anger over injustice. What in particular creates sadness and lament for you? Now, slowly open your hands letting go of the tension there and imagine that cool water is flowing into and over them. It is only in opening to the freedom and power God has given us that our hands become ready for loving action and not closed and ready to meet violence with violence. Roll down Roll down justice Roll like an ever-flowing stream Roll down Roll down justice
this roll like an ever flowing stream flowing stream roll down we come before you one who is goodness frustrated and angered by injustice often feeling helpless and powerless in the struggle. Rather than work at what we can for your reign of love, we just want to throw up our hands in resignation. Forgive us and remind us of the power you give us to name and resist evil in all its forms. Move us closer to compassion and courage to speak up and stand up for what is right and good. <laughs> 